Hello, sisters and friends. It's wonderful to be here together today. As we begin our first session of the series called Return to the Sources. This is one of the calls that we have received from the general chapter 2018, which we have further developed the, during the CGP 2020 with the metaphor of a flying kite and its string. And so the more we are rooted and the more connected we are, the higher we can fly. I take this opportunity to thank Sister Veronique, our general archivist, and Sister Rejivik and their team for preparing this program with genuine love for St. Mary Eugenie, our beloved mother, and with great passion for our charism. Thank you, Sister Veronique. And thank you, Sister Rejivik. So, sisters and friends, let us drink deeply from our sources and remain rooted in our charism. Let us fly higher, exploring always new ways of living our rich charism in these challenging times. Let us also profit from this experience of internationality and deeper communion. I wish you and wish you all an enriching time together. May God bless Assumption. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, dear friends and sisters. Thank you, Sister Reka, for your welcoming. I am happy what this foundation tells us about the charism of assumptions that we already know. I hope we will be able to, to go deep in this charism. After my talk, you know that you will be able to join the Zoom meeting 
and to share what you have discovered in order to live this international experience that Sister Reka was speaking about. So let's enter in this story of Otey. The decision of the Assumption community to move to Otey marks a historic step for the congregation. In fact, after moving from apartment to apartment, from Rue Ferrou to Rue de Beaugirard, then from house to house, from Impasse-des-Vignes to Chaillot, the Parisian community was set to establish itself for a long period in, of time in Auteuil. We can stop for a while on what marked the first foundations. As we know, one of the mark is the poverty. In the first apartments, then houses, the sisters were sharing their space with the pupils, with the student, who in general received the best share. They were saying the, the least cold or the most beautiful rooms were given to the children. And it expressed thing in a certain way. It expressed that the sisters were giving themselves for the young girls that who were under their care. Their priority, in a certain sense, was this mission of education and was the person of this girl that they were helping, accompanying as they were growing. Then another characteristic in these first years was that they moved physically fourth time. And it was a sign of an internal movement in the congregation. In fact, in these first years, the sisters are still searching for the right path. And it is a period in which Marie Eugenie is still struggling to express the goal as she sees it, especially to make it acceptable by church, by people in the society. In fact, for her, in this time, nothing is certain. And even the renown of the Assumption is still to be established. And the first students don't come soon enough. But little by little, at the Impasse des Vignes first and then at Chaillot, the boarding school was increasing in number. And in Chaillot, this house I, you can see here on the screen, in Chaillot, the sisters were lacking space. And another point is that in this moment, at the end of these years in Chaillot, the sisters were already leaving Paris for new foundations. First Cape Town in South Africa, and then Richmond in England. And then in 1854 and 1855 already two other new foundations in France. And so they were needing a place where they can meet, where they could meet each other from all the communities that were beginning at this time. This monastery of Chaillot, it was near the Champs-Élysées, so really in the center of Paris, became too small and the sisters were looking for a place where the Assumption life could unfold in all its dimensions. So look at the story of the foundation of Auteuil. It's like an opportunity to understand better this charism, this Assumption life that they wanted to develop. We can say that this project of relocation is based on three important, important elements. First, the need. They were looking for like 
preside, where silence reigned, with open spaces to help the contemplative and austere life. So this need for space. Second was the need for the space for education. And you know that Marie Eugenie was loving speak of the student like butterflies. This space they needed to learn how to direct their flight, to find the good orientation for their flight. Third point, they were needing to ensure unity and communion. They were looking like a place, a source place for congregational meetings at a time when it was beginning to expand outside of Paris. Contemplative life, education, space for education, and communion, unity. We can find already three important words for our assumption today. For obvious financial reasons, theory had to be sold before considering the purchase of another property, because the sisters had not a lot of money. In March 1855, this search for a new property became a reality because Marie Eugenie learned that the Empress had just bought for her sister the hotel of Madame de Loriston. And it was a house that was really near our house, house of Chaillot. And she was thinking that the Empress could also buy our own house in Chaillot. And so she could begin to think of finding a new place. At the beginning, she was thinking in a place near Chaillot, really in the same, uh, same area of Paris. But the transactions pro progressed less quickly than expected. And finally, they chose a new location. They chose a magnificent property, as the origin says, surrounded by woods, orchards, villas hidden in the trees, for a modest price. This modest price, it was already for a big, nice property that you can see in my back. On this property, in fact, in the middle of the woods, was the chateau of the Tuileries that you can see. This castle was so called because of the tile factory that was established there in ancient time. In the 16th century, this factory became a hunting lodge and then a chateau that belonged to prestigious family. Even Napoleon came here. In the fall of 1855, Marie Eugenie signed the final contract for the sale of Chaillot and the purchase of the Tuileries. And they can begin, they can prepare the construction work. As you see on this large property, there was only one building, the small chateau with this tower. It's difficult to install nuns in this castle. And the project was therefore to put a boarding school in the chateau and to have an adjacent, an adjacent monastery built for the community and the novitiate. And Marie Eugenie, as a great project, she wanted to draw, to build the monastery that you see in my drawings. A monastery with four sides 
a monastery for contemplative life. You see around all trees. She wanted to build this monastery. But the installation of Auteuil had a financial impact on the young congregation. And the sisters had to save money for a long time. And so they were always very careful about expenses. It's also a sign of Marie Eugenie. She wanted many things, beautiful things, but always being careful about expenses. And she is like proud of all the small savings she can make. And so she gives her the constructions of two wings of the monastery in order to give priority to the development of the boarding school. At the end, here is the monastery that was built. Chateau. And you see only two wings where the sisters were living and praying. The chapel was in the castle. I will tell it after. For me, it's only a personal interpret interpretation, but for me, these four wings that become two wings are like the sign that this monastery that could have been closed in itself was still open to the world. And in this monastery with its two wings, contemplative life can be lived, can be lived, but at the same time, there is a space to welcome and to welcome life from outside in this private place. And we will see later in the talk that the life from outside is coming a lot. So the phase of major works can begin. In March 1856, the foundations of the new monastery were dug. And it was quite a discernment to choose the healthiest location in the property. South, north, east, west. Auteuil was the first monastery whose construction Marie Eugenie was to direct. It is the first of a long series. The archives are filled with plans of different places where the assumption was going to be established during Marie Eugenie's time. We can find the projects, we can find the foundress annotations, the letters to the architects, the comments in the letters to Father Dalzon and to the city. She is always working on these buildings, on these constructions, on this new project. In April 1856, the first stone was laid, and we have here the scroll when you can see all the names of the sisters and the pupils who have been part of this benediction, blessing of the first stone. It is written in Latin and signed by the bishop who was here that day. And we can fi find all the names of the sisters. The first, of course, is the one of Marie Eugenie, perhaps you can see it on the scroll. This moment of the blessing of the first stone, Marie Eugenie also prepared it for a long time. She looked for which word of God we are supposed to read, what are we supposed to put in the stone to give uh, uh, a sign, so many things. She, she thought of it very precisely. From this moment, from the exterior to the interior, Marie Eugenie leaves nothing to chance. And as with everything she does, she's inspired by other congregations. She visits other places. In fact, she takes the best of what exists and adds her personal touch. And she studies well the plans, 
even to the detail of the shape of the stones and sculptures. And in fact, the archives another time contain so many plans of the very beginnings, drawings of columns or cornices. And we can almost look at these documents, thinking that Marie Eugenie is beside us, that she's commenting and imagine and saying something to Verdier, the architect, to Father Dalzon, to Mother Therese Emmanuel. Mother, Mother Therese Emmanuel and Father Dalzon took over the supervision of the work when she was out of Paris. And so she was controlling everything on the work of the architect. And we have the leaflet of all the drawings. I think we can see in that her care, her care for the project she wanted to build. She even proposed the design of the massif or the drainage plan of the loans. And she would put Father Dalzon, the founder of the Assumptionists, at work. In fact, she invited him to come to Auteuil for a rest before the monastery was built, was finished. And he will do it for a few months. And she wrote to him before he came. Perhaps you will be able to gather together your first novices there and take a rest while having trees cut down and watching over the buildings and the garden, for which we will be very grateful. In fact, Father Dalzon, upon his arrival, was therefore appointed supervisor of the work. Unsettled in, on the days when Marie Eugenie did not come, or when she was out of Paris, he would write to give news. He took great care of the garden, but when Marie Eugenie was away, he sometimes feared that his arrangements would not please the fundress. And he was saying, oh, I prefer not to do something before last time we were not so happy with what I have done. In any case, we can see that he loves this place. And in many of his letters, he testifies that. For example, today, he writes to one of the sisters, La Tuilerie is, ready, is more ready every day to receive its future inhabitants. It will be a beautiful day when they will come, almost too beautiful. What treasures of wisdom will be enclosed in these cells where a little holy poverty will over reign. To build this monastery, of course, with all the trees that were around the property, trees had to be cut down. But what is a main characteristic is that Marie Eugenie took of these trees throughout the construction period. Father Dalon, Dalzon wrote to her one day, before you leave, I want to point out a fact that I noticed last night. Mr. Demion, who was a gardener, cut down yesterday the trees at the end of the woods that you didn't want him to touch. You might have to give some instructions on this. And a few days later, he says, we are preparing the yard. We are maintaining the trees that will protect you on the side of the street. You means the house. We haven't even touched the others, but we may have to make a decision on a few that will make the place too humid or that will prevent the new building from drying well. Through these letters, we is never an insignificant decision and Marie Eugenie. And Marie Eugenie wants to it as much as possible. One day, she sends a sister 
and she said, I want to send a sister who cares about trees to verify if it is really necessary to cut down these trees. So I think we can see that in a period in which, which is not a concern, Marie Eugenie opened the way to an ecological concern. And she really inspired us with this ecological concern. This will be found in many, many other houses. We can see in many letters uh, about other monasteries, about other foundations, uh, that she says to the superior, be careful with the trees. First, you have to put trees and don't cut the trees. And one in one of the letters, we can also find the list of the trees that she likes. So I will give it to you in case you have them in your garden. No? Uh, she says that uh, the trees she likes are light trees, St. Lucia cherry trees, acacias, sycamores, fake ebony trees, lilac or lilac, I don't know in English. And she says, I like these trees, they are, they are cheap, but they grow easily. So you can check if you're in your gardens if you have these trees. I can then give you more names because there are other lists. With what I have said, I think you feel the desire to have a walk in this garden. And we are lucky because some students or some sisters, we don't know exactly, made beautiful shulk drawings of the garden at that time. And so I will propose you now to have a walk thanks to these drawings. You can see the monastery. And we can imagine the sisters, the students, we are playing, we are talking. It was not a garden, it was like a, a wood, really, a big space. And we can also give thanks to these sisters or students who made the drawings, no? And to all the people who make it possible for us now to, to discover this story. Another characteristic of this monastery was that it was built between tradition and modernity. And in the many documents we have, we have, for example, a review of architecture, famous at that time, very specific one. And the specialist, the expert, who is writing, says say something very interesting. In fact, it doesn't know a lot, it doesn't know a lot the religious life, but I will tell you what he is writing. He says about Oteuil. Well, it is not a monastery in the technical strictness of the world. It is not a convent, nor a congregation, nor a college, nor a boarding school. 
It is all of these things at the same time. I think this man with assumption life says something very interesting. Assumption place is not only a monastery, it's not only a convent, only a college, only a boarding school, only a dispensary, only a something else. It's all these things at the same time. And he says something about un unity of life in assumption. In this place, this unity of life is very explicit because, for example, I have told you already that the chateau became the boarding school. But can you guess what became the chapel? The chapel was installed in the room where before people were dancing. We are having a reception or music concert. In this place of public life in the castle, they put the chapel. In this place where people were coming to meet each other. And Maria Jenny, one of her characteristics also, is to take opportunity from the place she has for the things she has. This chapel I am speaking about, we have some small, at the time we had some small pieces of the stained glasses, and so they could read the stained glasses of the first chapel. Then, with all the movement, it has been. And we can see the plans of the first boarding school in the castle. And so if I Turn back to this review and the article. They say also that the cloister kept the very pure lines of Gothic architecture. And they gave the long cell corridor, the refectory, the community room, and the chapter room that religious aspect which left the soul with a deep impression. We don't know exactly what was this deep impression, <laughs> but Something very contemplative, we, we guess, no? And we can also see what they built outside the, the monastery. You can see here the vast double ramped porch that rise up from the ground below the garden to the vestibule. And what I propose you now, in fact, it will be to close your eyes, but I, you won't close because you are going to see. But you can close and imagine that we are going to discover all the frescoes, the frescoes painted by Sister Anne Marguerite in the cloister, in the cloister walls, the walls of the refectory. In fact, we have in the archives all the pictures, all the photographs of these frescoes. And really, it's a richness. So I propose you now to open your eyes and to see these frescoes. In the cloister, it was all the life of Mary, of the Virgin Mary. 
all the mystery of her life are here. And so we can like enter a contemplation and the sisters were able to contemplate all this mystery while they were passing by the corridors to a place to another. I show you also what is this chapel, this room for reception transformed in chapel. You see that it is a special style. And I can show you then the refectory because in the refectory we have something very special i don't know if you see this on the roof on the top these are like beams and iron joists very visible outside of the construction and it was called the eiffel style in fact if you see that Real, the one who came to Paris recognized that Eiffel Tower is built in the same way. It was the style that was in vogue at the time. And so in this monastery, there is at the same time the Gothic construction and the Eiffel style, the last style in vogue in Paris at that time. Tradition and modernity are together in this monastery. Another thing that Marie Eugenie was knowing very well, the, the article of the review, it is written, it all the system to warm up the house. She knew all the system, all the names of eating systems, all the kinds, all the prices, the possibilities, and she will conceal you everything you want in that uh, in that uh, uh, area. So the monastery was built, and in August 10, 1857, was the inauguration of the place. And daily life was organized little by little. Even 10 years after they built the monastery in which we are now, the Convent of Immaculate Conception, the Petit Couvent, the place where I am speaking and where the community and the General Council are living now, this Petit Couvent was inaugurated in 1866. So I propose you now to discover more of the daily life in Auteuil. I have already said it, Auteuil is first a place for education and we have few, but we have some list of the students that were here at that moment. Here is a list of the students and uh, when they uh, arrived and when they went. This is the list that they were supposed to send to the inspector for the state. A place of education, and there were these small leaflets that some of, of the sisters have already seen. They were the sisters were writing so, small leaflets to present the project of the house. 
In this leaflet, we can see that the aim is to provide an education that offers all the educational development that the customs of the world de demand today of young girls. But with all the guarantees that religious education offers, world and religion. It is a question, says the leaflet, of combining solid studies with a profoundly Christian direction, with a unity of plan spirit. In the plan, the sisters are teaching everything themselves, even science. Science were not taught to, to young girls at that time, so it was something very special. So the sisters were teaching science, and we have still some microscope of that time. This microscope was from Oteuil, it went to the valley and came back. They were also teaching language, foreign languages. And many of the times, the sisters who were teaching foreign languages were native from the place of this language. Now we speak about native teachers, no? And can you imagine that the students, and there were uh, many, who were coming from other countries, were receiving grammar and literature classes in their native language. So we have like personalized studies that respect the roots of the students. But at the heart of the studies, there is something else that this leaflet and the sisters with it, with it are calling education. What means education? To enlighten the minds of young people in order to attach their will to the good, to strengthen their faith, to make their minds as Christian as their hearts, to prepare them for the duties of the world. And limiting the number of the students, the sisters could also have like, they, they will look after the students like a mother look. No, they had like a mother look on the children. But they wanted also to learn to teach simplicity of taste, simplicity of taste and simplicity of habit. Once a week, the girls were also working for the poor people with needlework. And the words that we find to qualify this education are vigilance, solicitude, maternal tenderness. In this place, for the sisters and the students, there, were, uh, there was also a festive spirit. In fact, in the document we have, we see that celebrating is part of life in Auteuil. And we have so many papers for all the feeds. Sisters and children, young, older students were together for the feast. I have taken some examples. That one is a sheet for the Feast of Assumption in 1864. It was, in fact, the 25th anniversary of the foundation. And this feast was beginning like that. We have, as bond among us, on earth, charity. Charity that we have drawn from your heart, Christ. And so this feast, was beginning by a reminder of unity and charity drawn from Christ. Because feasts were opportunities for joy, but also opportunities for faith. 
And so the sisters and students were celebrating, celebrating of course, Assumption, but also uh, the Feast of the Holy Name of Jesus, for example. There are so many things of this feast. And St. Catherine Day. St. Catherine's Day was a very big feast, and they were ma making like very official uh, invitation. Many times the elder one were inviting the, the smaller one, the younger one, and in this one, it's very interesting. I just say some of the things that are, that are written, written in this one. The Feast of St. Catherine of Alexandria has always been part of the tradition of Assumption, a day of joy and creation. The priority is enjoy yourself with all your heart. And before the feast, we have to guard against any difficulties that arise and that would prevent the expansion of your joy. And so, after conferring with our mistress and other mothers in charge of the education, order the following. There will be celebration of two masses. There will be silence in the dormitory before the feast to prepare yourself, ourselves. A good meal to take strength. And we can run in all the alleys of the garden, but not on the lawns, like now, no? <laughs> this was prepared together by the sisters and the students. And some of the students are given precise roles. For example, they say, we entrust Anne-Marie Blaninier and another one to maintain joy among their companions and to revive the enthusiasm if it is in danger of diminishing. And as their motto of these two girls, tomorrow must be as cheerful as a finch, we give them one of these little birds that they will wear as decoration all day long. In charge of the joy. Other girls are in charge uh, became megaphones. <laughs> Some of them artists, it depends on their competence, I guess. So joy, talents, initiative of the students, respect. These are words that we Assumption of the 21st century, we know well. They were also experimenting a form of co-responsibility in the organization of this Enfant de Marie, Children of Marie, where the student could enter. It was like a, uh, an organization, an association, and they could enter with a vote. And the, the, the students were voting, and also the sisters. We have some of the sheets of the votes in the archives. So sisters and students together in this house, in a contemplative place, with education project in a festive spirit. This place was also, I have told it, a place of communion for the congregation. And so they invent like our first new letters, no? Like some review, some small review written by hand with drawings where they could share all the news of the place from a convent to another, because it can be also from the small convent to the big one, and also the foundation outside. And the price, the amount to to get this um, this uh, newspaper, the price of the subscription was a dozen of rosaries. You had to pray, no? So, Ote became also a place of communion, of communication. And in 1858, the first general chapter was held in Ote. This chapter in which Marie Eugenie was elected superior for life. Unity is thus built around Christ, first of all, then around her and the first sisters who accompanied her. 
and around Hauteuil, which has become the mother house. The source, the place of the source of the congregation. In Hauteuil, the sisters now will come to recharge our batteries to make their summer retreat, for example, to come to sessions, to group of work, a central place. We could believe that in this beautiful monastery, life is preserved from the troubles of the world. It is not at all the case. World events have a strong impact on the life of Hauteuil. Here, here is one example. I think I won't have time for the second one. One example is the siege of Paris in 1870. In 1870, France was at war with Prussia. And France will lose the war. It will be the beginning of a big chaos in the country, which will lead to the proclamation of the Third Republic. The chaos was in all the country, but especially in Paris. And the annals of the community like a newspaper of that time, perhaps better than a newspaper that, of that time, recount the dramatic events and the commitments of the sisters in this period. It was more or less nine months, one year. What happened? I was telling it, in Paris, it was chaos much violence, they were destroying all what was the sign of the institutions of before. And so in August 1870, a large number among the sisters had to leave almost overnight the monastery to be safe. Therese Emmanuel was among the first to leave the monastery and one of the sisters wrote to her after. What a hard time, dear mother. Those who flee feel sorry for those who remain. Those who remain have their worries. However, it is the hand of God that juggles us in this way and we must adhere to him. In these difficult situations, be sure that the hand of God guides you, leads you. But also do something. And Marie Eugenie wanted really that this monastery became a military hospital. Well, in French, we say une ambulance militaire, a place where you can welcome hurt soldiers and take care of them. And so we can re read in the annals. When it was more or less certain that the Prussians would lay siege to Paris, our mother wanted to make of our convent of the Immaculate Conception a military hospital. It was the case of many congregations at that time. She asked to whom it should be offered and was told that it was to the mayor of Passy. The sisters took the necessary steps and Auteuil signed up for 100 beds to accommodate the sick. Then the sisters had to find doctors and nurses who would help them. And in the meanwhile, Marie Eugenie herself had to leave Paris because it was more safe for her and she has to continue to lead the congregation. So she went first to Poitiers Bordeaux and then she stayed for a long time in Nîmes. She became displaced like many others at that time. So Auteuil was a military hospital. I will just tell you thanks to the annals, 
the welcoming of the first wounded man who came. A wounded man is here. He asks to be received in our hospital. A very young soldier, almost a child, who tells me that he was in Sedan, a city of France, east of France, at the time of the disasters. That he had escaped so as not to be a prisoner. That he had spent five days hidden in the woods during which he had eaten only green apples that the shepherds had not wanted. I asked him where he was wounded, wounded, and he answered that a horse had stepped on his foot and crushed him. I took him to the hospital, put him to bed, and looked at his foot. The big two was indeed all crushed. I made the bandage that seemed to me sweet, to be suitable, and I thought that we could wait until the next day to have the doctor call. So in this place, the sisters themselves are the ones who give the care, supervised by the doctors, but they are not nurses, I remind you. They are all teachers, no? <laughs> so it was a big challenge. Another very nice story that we can find in the annal is another soldier who come, very hungry, and the sisters recounts. I saw a poor soldier sitting on the, man, on the bench in the vestibule who looked very tired. I walked towards, towards him and asked him what he wanted. A cup of soup, he replies. My poor stomach is in bad state. For 14 days, I've only eaten turnips found in the fields. Then he told me that he had come from Sedan, the same city, that he had escaped from there, not wanting to remain a prisoner, with other soldiers. One day, when they were dying of hunger, they passed in front of a poor farmer's house. They went in and asked for food. They found a woman there with her grandchildren. She brought them bread and said to them, this is all I have in the house. I give it to you willingly, but after this, I will have nothing for my children, nor for myself. You can imagine, sister, he added, that we did not want to take our bread and left it to that poor mother. The sisters follows. When he had taken the soup, I asked him if he would like to eat pork lamb chops. He answered, with pleasure, sister. I served him. After that, I gave him someone, something else. He ate like a very hungry man. I thought it prudent not to offer him anything more. He might have been unable to find enough to eat. So, really, the sisters are living directly in life what the, the country is living now. And from afar, Marie Genie is with the sisters. She writes to the sisters. With what emotion I am writing this letter at a time when our communications are about to be interrupted. How oh, my heart is with you and how much it costs me to be far away. I see the need for this because of the concerns of the congregation. Finally, it is necessary to suffer it and to offer separations and anxieties to God we re who receives and counts every sacrifice. May you at least know how much I am with you and bless you all. So we are far from each other, but we are in communion. At the end of this period, the sisters will lack everything, food, light, heating, and at the end, really, the house was 
vandalized. In 1871, the convent was looted, and a student who came to see the sisters relates a written to Oteuil. We have here the, the letter to Oteuil, to a, one of the sisters who is not in Paris. And she describes everything that is touched by, by this vandal, by this uh, loot, no? loot. She says there is a Christ that was riddled with bullets. The do doors of the cells were broken down. And she says that she no longer recognized the place. At the end, on April 10, a bomb fell in the refectory. And Marie Eugenie herself describes the place on her return. She says the garden is intact. Only a few trees have been struck by bombs, but there are plenty of them still alive. Grotto, tents, greenhouse, everything is intact except for the statues. That of the grotto is broken, Our Lady of Victory is beheaded. The Immaculate Conception, this house, is intact except for some shrapnel. It is being repaired. The monastery hit by shrapnel on the roof, on the cells above, on the dormitory of the lay sisters, the refectory. Everything is soiled by looting, disorder, the most revolting garbage. Not a cupboard, not a box, not a corner that has not been emptied. Every, everywhere there are racks, paper back stone, cartridge all around and debris of all kinds. The virgins, the crucifixes are broken, but all the large paintings that we have seen are intact. When she will come back, she will try to make lists. This is draft of her letter. She will try to make list to get compensation for, for what we have lost, but she didn't get it. But she was making with the sister all the list, the price. We have many of this list. Here is one part of the story of Otei. I could tell so many other stories because it's only one. But it says that, no, Otei was not a place out of the world. It was not a mystical place who was not suffering the suffering of the world. It was a place of communion with the world. In this place also, in front of the statue of Our Lady of Consolation, has been found this um, foundation of the Assumptionist Brother called Our Lady of Salvation, that would work for um, poor people, for sick people, for popular masses, in a moment where um, popular masses were separating from the from this church. And Marie Eugenie encouraged this foundation, foundation. Now the statue is in the house of our brother, Assumption in Brother. Another sign of this presence of the world here in this house. After that, in, in, at the end of the 19th century, Otto flourishes again, and it, it's a period of big, big, big life, great life, until that day in 1898, where Marie Eugenie returns to the father and is buried in the chapel in the park, in the middle of the tree there. She joins Therese Emmanuel, who was here since 10 years. And from this moment, Nothing to see in the two events, but that's true that from this moment, it was beginning before, until the year 1903-1904, begins a new period of difficult difficulties, which lead to the dispersion of the sisters in 19, in the years 19. I don't tell the story, because it will be another story, but... In 1925, the big monastery was destroyed at the end of this new period. Well, throughout this journey, we have been able to note one by one 
important points of the spirit of assumption. I will not mention them again because they will be the object of our sharing during the meeting now by Zoom. So I thank you for being here. For your listening, I thank Sister Rekha, who is here in the room with me <laughs> as a single <laughs> person. And so we just now leave YouTube and we gather by the link that you received on Zoom. Sister Regina Victoria is waiting for you and I will join you after. Thanks a lot and see you soon.